Hello, Figgy Explorers. Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Outreach Collection. Today, we're talking all things entertainment. Let's go. All right, welcome back everybody. Our first object we're gonna talk about today are these guys right here. So these are pretty fun. These are known as stereoscopes. And you might be thinking, how do I use these? Where have I seen these before? Well, first of all, I feel like this is a common tool that you tend to see in maybe like your grandparents' house or anybody who collects antiques. They're very easy to find. I, these ones are actually purchased at an antique store. Um, they're pretty common. I feel like a lot, they're so common in fact that sometimes when you go to antique stores, they are just thrown in a box ready to go. Um, but you can see here, they have, um, they come in uh, slightly different types of materials. Um, traditionally, they were made with a wooden, um, a wooden body here. And then usually this part was metal, but you can see uh, this piece is actually tin, almost like a, um, a, like a tin can. And then this one has kind of more of like a paper, like leathery, like image to it. So, um, but both of them have this kind of like almost long nose on them. And then they have these dual eye, um, pairs of glass where you put your eyes. So how these work is this basically was a form of entertainment. It was a lot more engaging than just looking at a typical picture in a book. And the reason it was engaging is because the way that this is designed is that you put the image in on a card or a stereograph is what you could call it. So these guys right here, we actually have a whole bucket full of them. They are double images that are printed on this hardy cardstock. Um, originally these were printed on copper and then glass and then later move to this car stock, which is a lot easier for us because we don't have to worry about breaking them. And so what would happen is the photographer would take the same image twice or even more than twice. So maybe like different angles, different sides, um, that, so then you'd have the double image. And then what you do is that you take your stereoscope and you put your image in the little prongs like this. Make sure you don't put your image upside down like that. And then you look through it and then you wanna slide it so it's not blurry. So it kind of tricks your mind. So basically the way that the glass is positioned and your eyes are looking at the images, it blurs together into one image, which is pretty cool. And then you slide it back and forth. And sometimes these images actually look 3D as well. So it was a way to kind of interact with a picture more than just looking at it, say in a book or like at a museum. So it's safe to say as these were early forms of entertainment. Now the stereoscope was, um, technically invented in 1833 by a man named Charles Wheatstone. And then later he started the idea and then another man with the last name of Holmes created the patent for it. So it was basically known as the Holmes stereograph. And it was known as that from that time in the 1800s all the way through the 1920s. Um, these were so, uh, these catch, caught on so quickly, in fact, that in the 1850s at the Great Exhibition or the World's Exhibition um, in London, also known as the Crystal Palace Exhibition, um, Queen Victoria got a kick out of these because she would come and visit the exhibition and she thought these were just um, crazy. So because it was featured at the Great Exhibition in London, everybody basically had to have one. So they became this sort of like tourist commodity where wherever people went to travel, they had to buy a stereoscope. But the fun thing about stereoscopes is that aside from entertainment, they were also used to um, educate students as well. Because if you think about it, um, you could put whatever you wanted on these, on these, you could put whatever you wanted on these cards. So they were used to educate children in history. And so they would reenact different scenes from history. Uh, geography and actually anatomy too. Another reason why people use these for entertainment so much is if you think about it, a lot of people didn't have the money to travel to places, uh, ex you know, exotic lands, places like Europe. Um, so they, photographers could set up a scene that looked like a travel, um, that they, they were traveling somewhere and people could kind of, you know, change out all the pictures and feel like they're actually traveling. Um, nowadays we can just, if we want to travel, we can watch somebody do a travel video on YouTube or we can watch like a documentary, but back then they didn't have that. Speaking of that, um, the stereoscope kind of met its downside towards the 1930s, and that is because another very famous form of entertainment 
came into play, which was the movies. We all are familiar with the movies. We've all probably seen at least a movie once. So the idea that having a still shot image wasn't gonna be good enough anymore. So now people could actually go and watch people um, interact on the screen and eventually talk on the screen. So these kind of went to the wayside. They weren't really popular more. People weren't buying them. But they actually saw a resurgence um, in the 1960s with a, a toy called the Viewmaster. You might have seen pictures of this toy. I actually had one as a kid. And it's a little plastic red toy that basically looks like a mini version of this. And you put in a circular card and you hit the button and it circles through all the different images. And I feel like that toy lasted all the way up through like the 90s and early 2000s. And I'm sure it's still around today. So if you can, um, if you ever get a chance to play with one of these, um, like an antique store or we bring this out to you during an outreach lesson, I really encourage you to look at it. Or if not, to encourage you to collect these because these are really cool as well. Everybody, And for our second object we have here is something very special. This is a type of shadow puppet that comes from Indonesia and it's called a Wayang Kulit. Uh, Wayang comes from a word that means shadow and Kulit basically means leather or skin and the reason I could tell that it gets its name is, first of all, it's a shadow puppet. I don't know if we're all, we're probably all familiar with puppets, right? And of course there's puppets that have come from all different um, places around the world. Um, people do puppetry in many different ways. Um, we probably all played around with shadow puppets at one point in our life, even if it's just us using our hands against a flashlight and a blank white wall. Well, these guys are a little bit more elaborate than just using your hands. So the reason it has that term that means skin or leather is because if you'll notice, the material of the puppet is actually made, it's very stiff and it's made from this dried buffalo skin. And the way they do that here, you can see it's completely dried out. I have to kind of turn it around so you can see all different angles. And it's pretty elaborate. Um, it has a, depending on the puppet, of course, but it has this main stick to hold it up and then it always has different sticks to form the appendages. So this one has the arms. I'm sure there's other ones that have the legs that move as well. Um, and because as you can guess, they're used, um, they're used as forms of entertainment, um, mostly to tell different stories, um, usually epic tales from Indonesia mythology, uh, like gods and goddesses and battles against monsters and all those types of fun things. So we have the base, which is made out of the buffalo skin. And then we usually have these types of, I call them sticks, but they're not actually made out of sticks. So they're usually, traditionally they're made out of the bone of the buffalo. Um, otherwise you can find these made out of wood as well. And the process of making these is pretty interesting. Usually it's either a family trait, so that each generation passes down the way of making these Wayang Kulit puppets, or it's um, an apprenticeship. So somebody who's a master in these, you go and apprentice for them and you learn how to make them because these are very um, steeped in traditional values and every little piece of the puppet has something to do and has a, has a meaning. So for example, um, this is a character known as, this is a character known as Durodana, and basically he's a character from a big epic tale. And you can tell he is supposed to be like this fierce, unstoppable warrior. And the reason you can tell that is by the way, his puppet is designed. So he's standing like fiercely, he's supposed to be like indestructible. Think of like a, a god, he, nobody can defeat him. And so he's got this very like large stance and he's got these long arms, and he's very intimidating. And you can see just by the way he's shaped. So as opposed to this one right here, which is this guy is known as Buto Terong. And basically his name loosely translates to eggplants. And he's supposed to be an ogre type of character. So it's funny if you compare him to this guy, they are very different. They're both the same kind of puppet, but they're very different depending on their role in the story. So, and it kind of helps to create the characteristics too, right? Because if you have seen shadow puppets before, you know they're going to be in the shadow. So you're not going to see all this lovely color in details. You're going to see what's behind it. So you have to have a physical representation of what, what the character is and who you know you're looking at when you're watching the performance. So his character, like I said, means it basically translates to eggplant. And it's funny because he kind of looks like an eggplant. Like he's got this kind of like bulbous nose shape here and he's got a rounder body. Um, another reason his body is so round is because according to the tales, he is somebody that likes, he's an ogre that likes to eat and he eats and eats and eats and he's never full. So he's always eating. Like that's just his thing. He's kind of this goofy character. And again, you see that he has his arms that move with the different sticks and it's on both sides right here. Um, one thing to note about these puppets is that uh, one thing that's really ingrained in them is the idea of headdresses. So he doesn't have a headdress. 
they use headdresses as again a way to symbolize a, um, the character's class system. So there's over 25 different headdresses you can possibly see on a puppet. Um, and what I mean by class system is depending on the type of headdress, um, how simple or elaborate the headdress might be on the puppet, might represent a character who's either um, a servant or a priest or a, um, like a fighter or a nobleman, and it all just depends on what it looks like. Um, color also plays a big importance into the role of these puppets as well. So they're very artistic if you think about it. It's like almost like they're a, a painting on a stick. So um, the way color represents it is it depends on, again, what the color choice is and um, what the character is supposed to be representing. So for example, white might be used on a character's face to symbolize like um, innocence or like a youthful nature. Um, characters that are considered older and wise actually have this kind of black painted face or in, and their appendages as well. So actually both of these characters, I guess they're very wise because both of them have the black painting for their main one. And the black is supposed to indicate like an inner maturity um, that they've aged over all these times to the fact, the point that their faces have turned black for maturity. Um, red is supposed to indicate um, like a character's boldness because you think like red, like rage and like they're angry and they're just gonna go fight and it doesn't matter who they're gonna, who they're gonna fight. And then also a, just kind of like a decorative purpose, you tend to see the use of gold paint as well, which kind of goes along with the headdress. Um, the headdress is different because it's decorative and meaningful, but like on this one, you'll see, let me see if I can get a close up to the camera. He has these little gold detailings that just add a little bit more life to the character. And this one as well, this one, he's got a gold necklace. So as you can see, these are really fun pieces and I am so excited to bring these out to more of our outreaches. Um, these are something, as an example, I always tell people sometimes we have so many objects that I don't know about all of them and these are ones that I had no idea that we had that were just kind of hidden on the back shelf. And um, as you can tell, we are in a very lit gallery here. So unfortunately, I will not be able to do a live example of how the shadow puppets work. Please stay tuned to the end of the video and you'll get to see a brief showing of these puppets in action.